Uh, I am Francisco Flores, and I have the pleasure to introduce uh, today uh, Professor Dr. Patrick Pordon, my good friend. And um, Professor Pordon obtained his um, Bachelor in Science from Harvard College in Biomedical Engineering. He then moved to his PhD studies to the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, where he obtained also a PhD in Biomedical Engineering. Uh, currently, he's an um, assistant professor at uh, Harvard. Assistant, right? Associate. Associate, associate professor, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I diminished the rank. <laughs> uh, associate professor at Harvard, Harvard Medical School, and he's also a researcher at the Massachusetts General Hospital. So his research uh, integrates neuroimaging, uh, biomedical signal processing, and the system neuroscience of uh, general anesthesia. He's also done a lot of work in developing like all the technologies that uh, Pepe was saying that will help further the um, understanding and study and helping the general population into all these uh, topics of anesthesia and unconsciousness and how to monitor the state of consciousness during um, uh, clinical interventions. So without further ado, Professor Pordon, please. I often get mistaken for an assistant professor because I, you know, look so young. But but I'm actually old. You know, it's just you got to eat right, exercise, and sleep well. Um, let me. Um, uh, can I take a little poll of the audience? Um, uh, how many people here are, are uh, anesthesiologists? Okay, we got a few anesthesiologists. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And how about um, how many are neuroscientists? Okay. Oh, okay. Mostly neuroscientists. All right. And then uh, how many are engineers? Okay, two, uh, awesome, yeah, me too, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're in the minority, but, um, um, uh, okay, so, um, uh, you know, when we talked about uh, the session today, we thought we would make it a more clinical uh, talk, so, uh, and actually, I think that can be interesting for the neuroscientists, too, because you can literally see how uh, uh, the brain activity in the neuroscience uh, uh, sort of plays out, or could play out uh, in, in the operating room. Um, so we're going to be looking at um, uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, kind of newer, I guess, neuroscience principles that we're trying to introduce into the clinical education, and then we'll look at case studies, um, uh, actual, real-life cases from the OR, and hopefully that'll be interesting. Um, uh, so just some disclosures. Uh, so uh, uh, we have uh, uh, licensed uh, uh, a patent to Massimo uh, uh, from Mass General. Uh, I've also received speakers on rare from them. Um, I'm also an inventor on patents uh, uh, that have been assigned to Mass General uh, that are related to uh, uh, brain monitoring. Uh, but most of the, actually all the support for this work has really come from my department at Mass General as well as uh, the NIH. So we've been very fortunate to be able to receive that support and that allowed, allowed us to develop this new framework for monitoring. So let me start off with this uh, uh, question. So it's going to be obvious to neuroscience engineers, but I think it hasn't been obvious to anesthesiologists. You know, the question, why use the EEG? Um, okay, so first of all, um, the EEG has a form that relates fundamentally to the mechanisms and brain states that make up uh, uh, anesthesia-induced uh, unconsciousness. So it's a direct readout of the brain state. So that's part one. So the second is that actually the form of that EEG signal changes um, uh, uh, as a function of the dose. So you change the dose and the signal changes. So if you put those one and two together, then uh, it's clear that you can actually use the EEG to, in real time, read a patient's brain state and just adjust the doses uh, uh, accordingly. Now, as simple and straightforward as that idea sounds, it, it, it's actually a little bit contrary to the existing uh, uh, framework. So Pepe mentioned um, that uh, that currently uh, um, uh, anesthesiologists use, you know, primarily, you know, cardiovascular and autonomic signals to um, uh, to uh, um, monitor uh, anesthesia, um, and then in addition, they use these other things called uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic models. So. Um, and this is very typical within medicine. So the idea is that, okay, we can have a model for how uh, the drug goes in and how it um, uh, sort of distributes um, across these different compartments, you know, and especially into the brain. Uh, and then given some drug concentration in the brain, um, uh, uh, you can uh, measure the response and then characterize across a population of people, you know, what the response is. And then you can later use that as a way of guiding the dosage uh, for the drug. So, so this ED50 is the, the point at which 50% of people, say, uh, um, lose their response uh, to, say, an external stimulus. So that's great. That's a nice rough guideline. But that really only applies for uh, a population. You know, you have an individual patient that comes in. You don't really know how they respond to the drug. So, you know, you're more than likely to be off. 
And actually, um, um, uh, uh, anesthesiologists put a lot of faith in, in these models because it's all they've had for most of the uh, uh, history of the field. Um, but in fact, um, as you can imagine, um, uh, those models can be off. So um, uh, this is an example of how um, a, a study where you know state-of-the-art uh, modeling of uh, propofol, an intravenous anesthetic drug, um, was uh, administered was used to uh, predict when patients lost consciousness uh, uh, with increasing levels of propofol, and on average they lost consciousness where the model predicted. But of course the spread was quite large for individual patients. Sometimes they, they lost consciousness, cons uh, consciousness at a higher dose than predicted, and others uh, at a lower uh, concentration than predicted. And that can vary a uh, factor of two above or below the the, um, um, uh, the kind of median uh, dose. So you can imagine that. Um, uh, uh, any given subject, you're likely to be uh, uh, under or overdosed. Um, so uh, then bringing this back to the question, you know, why use the EG? Well, the EG makes it possible to provide like a personalized anesthetic. So everyone gets the right dose essentially, if we can read the EG. So let's just, let's just build our intuition as to whether we could actually read the EG. Because um, uh, um, for a long time that maybe wasn't clear. So we're going to look at a case. We'll start off with a case study. So this is, um, a 60-year-old woman who is uh, coming in for thyroid surgery, so she's going to receive a 150 milligram bolus of propofol, so just a, a intravenous um, um, uh, uh, infusion um, very rapidly, and uh, um, and this is very very typical. So let's just watch this video of the EG as as she's um, um, receiving this propofol. Okay, so here. Um, um, you can see like little uh, uh, eye blinks. There's a little muscle artifact there. Here's an eye blink, eye blink, eye blink. Um, I should have turned on the audio because you can hear that her heart is beating and everything. So, <laughs> um, uh, so there's a heartbeat, heartbeat. Um, or sorry, not heartbeat. Uh, eye blink. Excuse me. Uh, oh yeah, maybe just turn on the uh, the audio. You just click that uh, audio there. There we go. Yeah, that'll work. You can hear a little bit. Okay, so you can see this fuzz here. That's electromyogram signaling, uh, probably from the burning sensation. It's a little uncomfortable when the propofol goes in. So, so now you can start to see, you know, the beginnings of an organized oscillation here. Um, and every one of these marks is about one second. So oh, look at that. Then something changed really abruptly. And then that got a little bigger. And Okay, so something happened here. Something different is happening here. Okay, look how flat that is. Oh, that's fine. It, the, the audio wasn't that important. Okay, so um, so this is a very typical um, pattern of events during induction of anesthesia, and we're just measuring four leads of EG on the front of the scalp. It's nothing special. Okay, so let's take a look at. Um, no, it's good. It's good. I don't need more. Thank you. Thank you, though. Yeah, I should have just remembered to turn that on. Um, so what did we see here? So we saw, uh, to start off with, um, at this point, um, some beta and alpha oscillations. So beta being 12 to 25 hertz, alpha 8 to 12. Um, uh, you can see there's this kind of slowing through the course of this four second period. Um, we uh, uh, next saw um, superimposed on the alpha oscillations, this slow oscillation. And it was kind of abrupt. It was very instantaneous. You know, it sort of happened in, uh, uh, from one screen to the next. So that's kind of interesting. And then a little while after that, we saw um, these uh, uh, flat periods here, alternating with this a uh, little bit of activity. So that's a pattern that we would refer to as burst suppression. So there's a suppression of activity here where um, brain activity is completely silenced. Uh, and then um, uh, this uh, uh, burst of activity here, uh, which actually is just kind of, in, in a way, a, a version of this. Okay? And, and actually, to go backwards, um, so in this state, uh, we could predict that the patient would be um, sedated, um, meaning that they could maybe respond to external stimuli. In this state, uh, we would uh, feel confident saying they were unconscious, so they could not respond um, and regain consciousness after some external stimulus. Uh, and here, this burst suppression period is definitely an unconscious state, but one that's also associated with coma. So we might say that this is kind of beyond what you needed uh, uh, to remain unconscious for general anesthesia. So the questions I want to um, use to frame the rest of the talk are, you know, how do the how do we do these waves relate to sedation and unconsciousness? I mean, how do we know that the the relationship of, of the waves and the states? And then what are the mechanisms uh, underlying these waves? So we'll go through that. Um, so uh, again, to this audience, I, I, I think you guys know a lot of this, but 
But just to mention it, the um, uh, EEG is, of course, generated by a, a postsynaptic potentials from the cortex. Um, but of course, uh, the cortex and thalamus are richly interconnected. So when we see activity of the cortex, um, we, we're, um, we can make inferences about what connected structures might be doing, uh, particularly if we know a priori you know, how, um, uh, what the connections are and how the, those connections influence the, the dynamics. And um, again, to this audience, uh, um, a, a primary neuroscience audience, it's not uh, surprising that um, these oscillations are sort of really uh, uh, crucial or, or fundamental to um, organizing brain function. Um, so, uh, um, and, and just to illustrate kind of the relationship between oscillations and, and neuronal firing, here's an example from uh, uh, Crunelli and Hughes um, uh, showing um, um, uh, neuronal and uh, local field potential recordings uh, from, the, uh, from the thalamus uh, in a, I think in a cat. Uh, and you can see here clearly that the neurons are firing uh, periodically at uh, roughly uh, uh, 10 hertz, roughly an alpha frequency. And then you can see that the uh, overlying oscillations are, are you know, tightly synchronized to those uh, neurons. So when we, you know, of course, uh, see the oscillations either locally or uh, um, uh, at, uh, at the scalp, we can make the inference that underlying populations of neurons are, are firing uh, with, with some underlying uh, periodicity. Uh, and of course, these oscillations again organize brain function within individual circuits and across, um, you know, larger uh, networks. So you can imagine that if we were to introduce uh, drugs such as propofol that has a, um, you know, powerful uh, GABA agonist effect, so it amplifies um, inhibitory GABA signaling. So if we were to do that, you could imagine that it would throw off uh, the time constants for these circuits uh, and actually, you know, impose uh, um, uh, or, or impose oscillations or impair oscillations uh, that, that might otherwise uh, happen at different frequencies. Um, so let's just take a, a quick look to, you know, uh, place these things in scale. So here's a typical eyes closed alpha wave. So, you know, if we close our eyes, we don't need uh, so much the visual system. And so that alpha in some respects uh, reflects a, uh, a idling state for the um, uh, visual system. Um, uh, if we were to continue closing our eyes and, and fall asleep, um, we might see uh, these uh, slow waves for slow wave sleep. And of course, we know that um, uh, um, the slow waves sort of represent alternation between uh, transient down states and up states uh, where the neurons can fire. So that, and, and, and roughly, you know, maybe these might be like 50 microvolts in size. When we look at propofol, the oscillations are much bigger. This is one of the most surprising things. You know, when we started doing this research, uh, you know, back in the uh, uh, early to mid 2000s, we were expecting to see, you know, subtle little changes in gamma frequencies when the, uh, um, when the anesthetic went, went in. And no, it was like not subtle. We were like, whoa, what is that big thing? We weren't expecting that. But, but that's what you see, you know, um, uh, every time, just as you saw in the video. And, and, and it's much larger than sort of the endogenous uh, oscillations. So you can imagine the level of impairment, you know, compared to these sort of endogenous states of brain quiescence uh, are, are, um, are, are quite significant with the anesthetic drugs. Um, and, and actually, in anesthesiology, people sort of question, you know, whether the waves um, uh, really refl reflect anything fundamental. I think, you know, uh, um, but it's becoming increasingly clear to them, and, and I think certainly neuroscientists, that, that um, when you see these big waves, it's a big deal. Um, okay, so, um, so to get at this question of how do the, the um, waves relate to the states, um, you know, back, uh, back in the day, uh, myself, Emery Brown, and others from our uh, department did this uh, experiment in volunteers where we slowly uh, um, uh, induced unconsciousness with increasing doses of propofol and then slowly allowed uh, the uh, um, uh, um, propofol concentration to come down. And, and we asked the volunteers um, to uh, press a button uh, in response to these auditory stimuli. So we we're just trying to measure when they lost a responsiveness. So there are two types of stimuli. Uh, a verbal stimuli, um, as well as just some, uh, um, you know, kind of a simple click train. So um, that was actually, it turned out to be pretty important because it was true that actually the patients or the subjects lost consciousness at very different drug concentrations uh, as a whole. So we needed to really measure when an individual, each individual subject lost consciousness. So we could take the responses um, uh, to the different sorts of stimuli and then um, estimate a probability response for each class of stimuli. And then we could uh, um, uh, tell, well, when um, uh, the subject started to um, uh, perform poorly on the task uh, and then also when they, they finally stopped 
uh, responding altogether, and that allowed us to identify a point of loss of consciousness uh, for that um, subject, and then later a return of consciousness uh, 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 when they started responding again. So uh, after that, then, for every s single subject, we could line up the data, essentially register it in, in time around these points, and then figure out what was going on. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm lucky I'm showing up you know, midway through the conference because you already know how to do what I'm going to talk about next, which is spectral analysis. So of course the traditional way of looking at the EEG clinically is to just look at those waves. And as you can see from the video, that's highly informative. It's actually really easy uh, in, in some respects. Um, but to um, uh, quantify what's in the signal and in some sense to have more precision even in the clinical context, you know, we do need to do a little more. So, so um, we need to do spectral analysis and I'm just going to repeat this just for the benefit of folks who might not have been here uh, um, on a day one or two of the meeting. Um, so, in, so if we look at this raw EG trace, we can see, you know, there's some, definitely some organized waves there. But imagine if we were to break it down uh, into um, uh, components. So we could see here, if we, we knew a priori that these were the key frequencies, right, we could break it down and we could see one component that has about one cycle per second here, okay, here's one second, and then we might count out these different components here to get 10 cycles per second uh, on this other wave. But of course this is quite cumbersome, it's cumbersome to count the waves, and as more and more waves sort of combine it becomes really difficult. So it's easier than just to analyze the frequency content across all frequencies using the spectrum. So the spectrum is essentially estimating the amount of energy or power uh, in the signal. So sort of imagine taking the uh, approximate amplitude of the signal, squaring it, and then taking the log. Uh, uh, that's essentially what we're plotting here in a decibel scale. And as, so you can see then across all frequencies, uh, there's this big peak around one hertz, which corresponds to this rhythm, uh, and um, a big peak here around uh, 10 hertz, which corresponds to this uh, thing. And that's just at one instant of time. So of course, if we want to track how this changes through the course of a, an actual clinical anesthetic, then we can you know, track this in time, now kind of stacking these up in 3D. But 3D is kind of annoying, so let's put it into 2D with a color scale, where now the height of these peaks corresponds to this um, a color scale, where the hotter colors represent peaks, and then the cooler colors represent the smaller values. And then we'll put frequency on the uh, y-axis here, time and minutes on the x-axis. And so now you can see this band here at around you know, 10 or a little more than 10 hertz corresponds to this guy, which of course corresponds to that guy. And then this um, band here at around 1 hertz corresponds to this peak here in the spectrum and then this, this part of the waveform. So it all, all fits together. Everything we're seeing here relates back fundamentally to the underlying signal, but it just kind of gives us this quick snapshot and allows us to see changes you know, uh, uh, through time. So, so we took every individual uh, subject's uh, behavior, lined it all up, and, and sure enough, it has this you know, really, uh, um, I, I guess, uh, uh, in a way, predictable pattern that the less salient stimuli you know, sort of um, are um, less likely to provoke a response with increasing doses of the drug. Uh, and then if we look at the EG, the spectrogram, um, lined up around these loss of consciousness and recovery of consciousness points, uh, we can see then that um, prior to loss of uh, consciousness, essentially in a sedated state where the subjects can still respond, we see this uh, increase in um, beta and kind of low gamma uh, activity. But after loss of consciousness, we saw um, uh, this you know, quite strong slow oscillation and um, kind of uh, uh, high alpha band oscillation. And then um, at recovery of consciousness, we saw sort of uh, things uh, uh, go more or less in reverse. And, and uh, Francisco will have a lot more to say about that um, uh, later in the meeting. Um, so, so if we zoom in on kind of this uh, top part here, just like about two hertz and above, and we look at that a little more closely, uh, what we see is that with increasing propofol uh, infusion rates, there's a sort of this parametric change in the, the center frequency of this, of this band here. It kind of just slows down. Um, uh, it, it drifts down from like a beta frequencies to alpha. And there's this all, also this sort of um, smooth, like kind of narrowing in the oscillation too. Um, and then the reverse happens when we reduce uh, the dose. And, and of course we can identify these uh, states, these behavioral states. So basically this tells us that, that you know, um, we have like a really smooth dose response pattern that allows us to adjust the drug to whatever you know, state we need. So if we needed the patient to be able to uh, respond, um, say if we're doing a short a procedure um, like an endoscopy or something, you could um, uh, uh, place them in this state 
if they needed to be under general anesthesia, uh, where they had to be unconscious, um, you could put them in this state, and you could kind of um, uh, regulate that very, very uh, precisely just from looking at this um, uh, from the EG uh, and from the spectrogram. Um, so um, I'm not going to get uh, too much into mechanisms um, now because we're going to cover different aspects of it during the talk. I think later today, uh, Francisco is going to be talking about thalamocortical mechanisms, and I'll be getting uh, a little bit more into the slow oscillation mechanisms. But but just to give it a quick overview. Um, uh, you know, propofol is acting everywhere within the brain, amplifying GABAergic signaling, okay? But it does produce these two oscillations in the EEG. And through, you know, uh, uh, a significant body of work, we've, um, there's, there's a lot of evidence now that this is essentially a, um, um, uh, a, a, a propofol-induced uh, frontothalmocortical oscillation that sort of reflects a frontal um, functional disruption of, of this uh, thalmocortical circuit. Uh, and uh, the, the slow oscillation um, uh, represents sort of an exaggerated version of the up-down states that you can see during um, uh, uh, sleep uh, slow uh, oscillations. Um, and um, uh, we, we were able to actually get this from human recordings uh, where we could get uh, microelectrode arrays and grid ele uh, um, uh, electrode recordings in patients who were um, undergoing epilepsy surgery. So after um, having electrodes implanted, they stayed in the hospital for a week or two to uh, localize where their ep epileptic seizures were coming from. And then they had to go back to the operating room to have the electrodes removed. So that's just a, you know, that's an experiment for free. So we just had to show up and we were like little commandos, you know, they, 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 they wouldn't tell us when it was happening, but we'd show up anyways and, uh, and hook up the electrodes, record the data. And so we were able to uh, get this very, uh, uh, really useful information. And, and what we saw is that when the slow oscillation appeared, which, which was right at loss of consciousness, um, uh, you can see, you know, the, the slow oscillations at different scales here from LFPs to uh, ECOG. And, and just very briefly, the, uh, the neurons were, of course, coupled to the slow oscillations, and you can see that they're firing briefly for a few hundred milliseconds, but over that two-second uh, period, uh, they, they tend to be mostly silent. So, so our reasoning was that, you know, if the cortex uh, um, ha um, is, is um, silenced in this way during the slow oscillation, and then in addition to that, you know, you have this thalamocortical disruption, then that means that when you see this... Um, uh, pattern of slow and alpha, you're really legitimately seeing a very profound brain disruption. So if, so behaviorally, they're, they're, we know they're unconscious, but also at some fundamental neurophysiologic level, you know, we can be confident they're unconscious too. Okay, cool. So I'm going to um, spend a few minutes going through some other drugs so you can get a, a feel for those patterns. Then we're going to get into cases, which I think will be interesting. Okay, so this is um, uh, um, uh, ge general anesthesia maintained with uh, sevoflurane. So sevoflurane is a, um, uh, uh, a derivative of ether. So it's a halogenated ether. So, so really a, a cousin of the, the very first anesthetic from, you know, uh, back in the 1840s. Um, and uh, uh, it has, a, you know, it, it acts at a variety of sites, but it definitely has a really strong GABA A um, uh, mechanism. So, um, uh, not surprisingly, it has a very similar uh, EG um, uh, profile as as, uh, as propofol. So you can see the combination of slow and uh, alpha waves there during this maintenance of general anesthesia. And this is just clinical data. This is from patients we record from. And and the interesting thing we see though is that at uh, for, for some reason, um, we're not sure why, um, when you uh, increase the dose of the sevoflurane, the alpha oscillation will kind of continue to dip uh, down to in, into 10 hertz or slightly below. And, um, and then we'll see this kind of uh, increasing uh, uh, power in theta frequency. So we call that a, a theta fill-in, just, just to give it a name. Uh, and it happens at, at higher concentrations of the drug, uh, above the point where, you know, um, um, they, uh, patients tend not to remove to painful stimuli. So again, we don't know the mechanism of this, but, but at least it's useful kind of practically uh, in that if you need to go to those uh, um, higher levels of, of anesthesia, um, you can, you can um, uh, maybe titrate to that, that effect. Um, so I'll quickly look at dexmedetomidine. So dexmedetomidine has a, uh, 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 an alpha-2 mechanism uh, wherein um, uh, um, uh, um, alpha-2 receptor uh, 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 so, sorry, it's, an, uh, it's a presynaptic alpha-2 agonist that sort of uh, prevents re release of uh, norepinephrine. And so as such, it, it sort of um, um, uh, allows um, uh, the preoptic area to become active, um, inhibiting um, 
uh, 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 brainstem arousal centers, and also their direct effects on the cortex as well. So it, it has this effect that sort of um, uh, mimics non-REM uh, sleep. Uh, so when we look at the EEG, then you know we expect something to look at look like uh, non-REM sleep, and and it kind of does resemble it. So so um, here's an example of um, a sedative, uh, kind of a lightly sedative dose of of uh, dexmedetomidine. You know, very typical um, the, uh, thing that you would see clinically, and you can see that there are these um, uh, um, kind of spindle oscillations here that that are um, you know transient. So they come on and then they go away and then they come on. Uh, uh, and of course, that's different from what we saw with propofol, where that you know alpha beta oscillation was quite sustained. Um, and you can see it in the spectrogram too, where the um, uh, um, where the spindle oscillation sort of has a more staccato form, and it's actually sitting at a slightly higher frequency, you know, around 12 or 13 hertz. So more in the the, tra the traditional like spindle band, uh, sigma band of activity. So if a sleep EG person saw that, they might you know think that that looks like a non-REM two. And then in some cases, when we increase the dose of, of, of propofol, this has a slightly higher maintenance dose, we can sometimes see these um, uh, spindle oscillations go away, and what we have is just a, a slow oscillation. So that you know, maybe looks like slow wave sleep. So we really think that, that um, um, uh, dexmedetomidine sedation uh, uh, closely mimics uh, true physiologic sleep. Um, and, and, but the interesting thing is that if we look at it quantitatively using the spectrum, if we were to compare, say, dexmedetomidine in blue, right, to propofol in red, um, uh, we can see that although the EG has a similar form, I mean, uh, except for maybe some details with the spindles, the, uh, the, the dexmedetomidine uh, EG pat, um, waves are much smaller. So it's sort of like that first slide I showed you with the different, you know, endogenous oscillations in the propofol. You know, the propofol um, induced oscillations are much larger, so we think that it has a much more profound um, a disruption of brain function. And sure enough, that uh, if you give uh, dexmedetomidine clinically uh, at those doses, you can actually arouse the patient to consciousness. So they they can you know respond if you talk to them. They'll be very comfortable and they'll be sedated, but you, you can actually wake them up. So so we think that um, um, difference in the um, you know uh, ability to arouse the patient is related uh, to the to the uh, size of the oscillations and, and the level of the underlying disruption. Um, okay. okay. Um, so one more uh, drug, and we're going to see these again in the case studies. So that's why I'm presenting them. So um, uh, um, ketamine, um, uh, you know, is a, a, of course an NMDA uh, antagonist. Um, uh, interestingly, at low doses, it seems to have an effect preferentially uh, on um, uh, on uh, uh, inhibitory interneurons. So so. The, the effect is that, that by blocking the inputs to these inhibitory interneurons, you know, you might predict then that, that um, structures that are being inhibited, like cortex or the uh, uh, limbic system, might then become disinhibited, and then it might create sort of an excited state. And certainly behaviorally at low doses, you, you do kind of see that people, you know, develop hallucinations. And so you can imagine that if, if that sort of inhibitory control were removed, they, they, they might... Um, um, uh, uh, activity might be uh, discoordinated in a way that they could uh, actually hallucinate. And then in the EEG, we see a manifestation of that as well. So this is a, uh, a patient who's coming in for a, uh, a, a vacuum dressing change, so a, a, um, a dressing change for wound, and it's very painful, but they don't need to be uh, unconscious for that procedure. So uh, uh, um, low-dose ketamine uh, was administered in boluses here, and then you can see that um, the EEG kind of has this fuzzy, excited look, and if you do the spectral analysis, you can see that that's actually kind of an organized oscillation around 30 hertz. Uh, so we see that very typically uh, with ketamine. Uh, there are also interesting effects when you combine ketamine with the other drugs. Um, uh, I don't have examples of that actually, but but uh, I'll just mention it. Um, okay, so so on the clinical side of things, you know, um, uh, you know, there there was this and and still is this construct that that whoa, e.g., it's too complicated. You know, people can't understand that and. And, and so uh, decisions were made in the 90s to take all that information and try to process it in some you know, empirical way and, and uh, reduce it down to a single number uh, between 0 and 100. So that made it easy to use in some sense. But the problem is that was a, a, a drastic oversimplification. You, know, you see that the, the drugs are doing you know, very different things in ways that make sense. So it, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that you could pool all that information just into one, um, uh, one number.
Uh, and I'll show you some other things later that, that also uh, kind of go against this concept. But I think in a way, um, in addition to simplicity, the device um, uh, developers were sort of responding to this this um, notion within anesthesiology that there was kind of just one mechanism. And it's funny because that, that um, idea of just a single unitary mechanism in a way goes back to, you know, um, over 100 years ago to just the observation that the potency of anesthetic drugs was related to their solubility in lipids. So <laughs> um, I just mentioned that parenthetically, I mean, um, but, but I think it goes back to that idea. Um, and, um, but in fact, I think, you know, in, in, in today's uh, neuroscientific point of view, we know that the different drugs, first of all, clinically have different, you know, behavioral um, um, uh, profiles, right? So propofol and sevoflurane can produce deep states of unconsciousness. Uh, ketamine uh, can produce states of hallucination. Dexmedetomidine produces this um, uh, state of sedation from which you can be aroused, right? Without knowing anything about the brain, we just know behaviorally they do different things. They have different molecular mechanisms, and sevoflurane's probably more GABA than anything else that are working through uh, um, different brain circuits. And so, you know, if we just view the EEG in terms of these squiggles, it would be hard to discern the differences. But if we analyze it, we see the structure of the oscillations really corresponds to um, the drugs and to the drug classes and, and drug mechanisms of action. So the new approach that we're trying to communicate um, to clinicians, and which I think is probably really exciting to neuroscientists, is that the different drugs have um, uh, different EG signatures that relate back to their fundamental mechanisms. And, and I think that'll be powerful um, uh, uh, going forward. So um, one other thing I want to uh, get into before we go into case studies, and I actually can I ask, how, how long do I have? When, when do I need um, to? Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll come in well under, well, plenty of time for questions. So um, uh, that's one advantage to talking too fast, right? <laughs> um, so, so with, uh, um, uh, let's take a look at how this changes with age. Uh, and if I have time tomorrow, I'll try to work uh, into this material more, because it's actually really interesting, I think, especially for the, the neuroscientists here. So here we have um, um, slow and alpha oscillations with propofol for this 30-year-old patient, okay? Let's take a look at uh, a 57-year-old patient, okay? So this uh, patient has slow and alpha oscillations also. Now let's take a look at an 81-year-old patient. So here's this 81-year-old, okay? Not interesting. Uh, now you have to squint. You can see it. It's there, and I'll, I'll, I'll prove that to you later. Um, uh, the, the structure's there, but it's a lot smaller. Now this one's really kind of interesting. So this is a 50-something-year-old patient who um, kind of looks more like the 81-year-old. So that's interesting. Uh, and then if we go to the other side of the um, um, age range, we have a 3-year-old, slow and alpha, 14-year-old uh, slow and alpha. And you can see that essentially the size of the signal seems to, 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 to scale with, with age. So um, I guess this points to another perhaps shortcoming of the existing, um, you know, one number, single number, 0 to 100 paradigm, which is that, you know, um, uh, um, really old people can kind of fool the monitor, and so can really young children. So, for instance, in young children, this, this kind of high power in the uh, uh, beta range can fool the monitor um, that was trained on adults to think that actually the patient's conscious. So in this state where the child is clearly unconscious, where they have clearly the slow and alpha oscillations that you know we know in adults at least are associated with the consciousness, the, the, the numbers will tend to read high. So it would tell the anesthesiologist, oh, you should give more drug. But in fact, you shouldn't, right? And then the opposite's actually true in these old folks. The, the absence of a signal that tells the monitor to, to bring the number down um, uh, causes the number to read high, and then the anesthesiologists are, are, are compelled to um, uh, to give more drugs. So, so it's interesting. But if you just look at the spectrogram and then you change the scale, uh, uh, the relevant inf information and features come right back. So, so this spectrogram is actually, uh, you know, very useful uh, for for accounting for differences in age. And then just to go back one more, you know, and then you might imagine, hey, there's got to be some uh, underlying explanation for all this that's, you know, related to, say, neurodegeneration and development. And we definitely believe that, and we have some papers on that. I don't have time to get into that today, but, but again, I'll try to work it in tomorrow. Um, um, uh, I think you guys will probably enjoy that. Okay, cool. So... Uh, now it's uh, time for a quiz. Okay, so I'm going to show you some spectrograms. You've seen them before, uh, and I'll give you a second to kind of uh, um, uh, examine them, uh, and then I'll just ask you guys, you know, uh, uh, to to uh, call them out. Okay, so um, all right, let's start with the easy one. Uh, which drug do you think this one corresponds to? Uh, 
Propofol, great. Okay, cool. How about this one? Yeah, dexmedetomidine. Yeah, dexmedetomidine. Perfect. Okay, um, and then how about this one? Did some people say ketamine? Okay, cool. Uh, and then how about this one? Sevoflurane. That's right. Good. Okay, cool. Great. A plus. Um, all right. Um, all right. So let's take a look at this. We saw this earlier in the video. Okay, so which uh, um, EG oscillations uh, do we see here? Yeah. So, so we do see the alpha, huh? and then, and then what else? Slow, slow delta. Yeah, that's great. So, um, um, so, and then what is most likely the patient's state of consciousness? Unconscious. Unconscious yeah. Good. Cool. All right. Uh, all right. And then here's another one. Uh, oh yeah, we're gonna get into this one later. I didn't talk about this one, but um, actually, this is unfair. I, I think I only mentioned it once, but yeah. Uh, uh, what, which pattern is this? Birth suppression, right, okay, cool. And then uh, what is most likely the patient's state of consciousness? In a coma or unconscious, yeah, cool. And then the patient's receiving propofol. Um, uh, so does this state occur at higher or lower concentrations of propofol? Higher, okay, cool, yeah. These are just basic things, but uh, awesome, this is great. So we'll see this again. Okay, so now let's get into some case studies. So good job, guys, thank you. Um, so let's take a look at this 60-year-old um, uh, patient. Um, uh, uh, she's coming in for a mastectomy, um, and uh, she's being uh, maintained with 1.3% uh, sevoflurane. So this corresponds to 0.7 MAC. So MAC is the the median dose, the ED50, the median dose at which the uh, patients are expected to lose responsiveness to uh, painful stimulus. Okay, so she's at at 0.7 of that. So it's kind of a low dose, you know, per the population. Uh, and this is age adjusted too. So this is like thought to be appropriate for her age. She's hemodynamically stable, okay? So let's take a look at, at, at the monitors. Um, so, so, okay, 0.7 MAC age adjusted. She's getting sevoflurane, um, um, oxygen. So, okay, that looks pretty good. I'm just an engineer, it looks fine to me. You know, um, uh, here's, uh, um, okay, let's see, uh, uh, heart rates at around 52. Okay, that, that seems good. Um, you know, 128 over 58 blood pressure. Yeah, that's a map of 85 mean arterial pressure. That's good. SpO2 99. So she's um, uh, uh, well oxygenated. Um, you know, she's got a good heart rate, um, uh, good blood pressure. So, okay, that's great. All right, cool. Everything's great. So let's move along. Okay. So if you look at the EEG, though, that tells you a different story. Okay. So this patient's actually, you know, just take a look at this. So it's kind of, first of all, the EEG is kind of small, um, not surprisingly, because she's a little older. But we look at this, and look, there's this kind of flat period here, this kind of flat period here, and then this is this little slow and alpha period here. So she's actually in burst suppression, okay? And then this number reads really low, um, which generally corresponds to a deeper state, right? And we can see through the history of this that, um, that it's been low for about, you know, it's 9.48 right now, uh, 9, 9 a.m. here. So it's been low for a while. It's been low for almost an hour, 50 minutes or so. And then there's this other thing indicator here on this monitor uh, called the suppression ratio, um, where um, which is literally the ratio of, of the suppressed um, uh, periods to the total time interval. So uh, if the suppression ratio is 100, that means they're fully flatlined, okay? So, so this, this patient's had some level of birth suppression throughout this whole hour-long period. Um, so it turns out birth suppression, uh, with the, according to the latest studies, is associated with postoperative delirium. It's certainly associated with longer emergence time because the patient has more drug on board than they need. So this patient's kind of, in a way, overdosed uh, on the drug, even though they're getting less than they're supposed to be getting. Um, so, uh, um, and, and this is something you know um, uh, that that has been reported in the literature. So this is a, a paper from 2011 showing that um, uh, patients who are maintained, you know, at a kind of appropriate EEG number, um, uh, they, they actually will, will still be in birth suppression and that risk for birth suppression increases with increasing age. Uh, and then um, uh, two recent studies have shown that uh, the time that you spend in birth suppression during an operation uh, uh, relates uh, to uh, the likelihood of having delirium and postoperative cognitive problems 
Um, so delirium, as you may know, uh, is a state of, of sort of uh, a confusion that develops um, uh, very often after surgery. And uh, delirium is related to, again, po uh, later um, uh, cognitive problems, and it's also related to uh, actually increased level, uh, um, incidence of mortality. So, so it's essentially some kind of, you know, uh, um, a acute confusional state, you know, uh, and we don't really know uh, uh, why it happens or what, what the, the, the pathophysiology is, but it's certainly, you know, not good and, and uh, it's, it, it in and of itself is a bad outcome. And again, it's related to post-operative cognitive problems. So you want to avoid this state. And you can imagine that if you weren't brain monitoring that anesthesiologists would, would kind of use the, the standard approaches, right? Heart rate, blood pressure, and, and they could, could probably um, contribute to this just um, by, by way of being putting their patients in a burst suppression without knowing it. Okay, so this is a um, oh this is another uh, a case. This is an interesting one, kind of on the other side of the scale. This is a situation where actually you would want to kind of maintain um, uh, um, the lightest anesthesia possible. Okay, so this is a um, um, uh, um, a, a patient with severe cystic fibrosis. So, um, and she's waiting for a lung transplant. Transplant. So, um, if you may recall, cystic fibrosis is, is this disease where um, I think there's a disruption in, in uh, I think maybe a chloride transporter. Although I, I, I'm a little fuzzy on it. But in, in essence, what happens is that that uh, there's a you know uh, a really um, uh, um, uh, a, a buildup of mucus within. Um, um, uh, the uh, the lungs, which uh, disrupts breathing, and it's actually you know usually fatal um, uh, uh, at an early age. So the fact that she's actually um, um, made it to 43 year, years old is pretty Im impressive. Um, uh, so and and it's so bad, of course, she's waiting for a lung transplant. She, so she has problems breathing. So in her default you know normal state at home, she she has to have supplemental oxygen. Okay, so that's how bad her breathing is, uh, and and uses daily uses bronchodilators. Uh, uh, to keep her um, uh, airway open. Um, she also has a um, uh, history of chronic pain and has high narcotic requirements. So she's, she's used to getting lots of anesthetic drugs and probably has um, a tolerance to the drugs and is able to clear them out faster. So um, uh, one thing we didn't mention earlier is that um, uh, anesthetic drugs all produce respiratory depression. So you get above a certain dose of the drug, patients will stop breathing. And that's the last thing you want for this patient here, okay? Um, and yet, they, they clear the drug really rapidly, so you got to somehow titrate it. Uh, and she has a history of anxiety. So these are all, you know, uh, potentially, um, uh, uh, potentially challenging. So um, I, I was over at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, and I had the pleasure of, of observing this case with um, uh, uh, Fred Shapiro, um, um, uh, a uh, professor at Harvard who, who uh, practices at Beth Israel. And so he's kind of developed this intuitive skill for, for giving kind of low doses of anesthetics, you know, um, um, he calls it office-based anesthesia to um, maintain respiratory function and not um, um, uh, um, uh, disrupt hemodynamic stability. Uh, and so his approach involves essentially giving, you know, small amounts of of uh, ketamine, dexmedetomidine, lidocaine, and propofol, uh, usually on top of a background of propofol and dexmedetomidine um, infusions. So he's doing this really intuitively. So we went to the OR to just you know, see what is actually happening in the brain during this uh, process. So this is about a 25 minute um, uh, period. Uh, um, so he starts off the case with uh, 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 a propofol infusion, about 50 micrograms, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, 50 micrograms uh, per, per uh, milligrams, per, sorry, micrograms per, per kilogram per minute. Um, um, and then he's reducing it slowly during that time period. Now, along the way, he's giving uh, small little boluses of um, uh, uh, lidocaine, um, uh, propofol in red here, uh, ketamine in purple. Oh, I can't really see the purple. Oh, there's one little purple, another one there maybe. Uh, and then uh, dexmedetomidine there in blue, so dexmedetomidine here, 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 and here. Um, and, and they're really small doses. So I'll just tell you right now, we're not going to see the ketamine effect because I think the dose is too small. But what do we see? Let's take a look. Okay, so actually, so I gave you the hint that we're, we're not seeing the ketamine, but, but take a look at that. What, what does this look like? Yeah, like a low-dose propofol, right? Okay, so that's cool. And then... And what does that look like? 
Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what's going on. So, so essentially what, what, what Fred figured out to do is start the case with propofol initially because you, you want to get going and, and dexmedetomidine takes, you know, tens of minutes to, to get started, right? And then later switch over to dexmedetomidine. That was his, his idea. And you can see he keeps it in the sedative range where the patient is sedated but, uh, but unlikely to get into respiratory problems. So, so that was kind of his idea. And so it's interesting to be able to kind of in a way decode what's happening just from um, uh, looking at the EG. And now, now once we know that, in some sense, we can replicate this you know, more easily, more precisely. Um, okay, here's another example. Just want to make sure I'm on time here. Yeah, we're good. Um, so uh, this is... Um, uh, uh, a case that uh, uh, Emery Brown uh, uh, did, uh, and it's sort of following a, a, a new approach that he's he's uh, um, uh, doing uh, that he refers to as a, a multimodal um, anesthetic approach, where he puts a lot more attention on on maintaining uh, anti nociception, so essentially controlling pain. So he's giving three different pain medications to sort of um, influence the uh, pain system through three different uh, mechanisms. So. Remifentanil block, blocks uh, mu opioid uh, receptors. Um, uh, ketamine, of course, is an NMDA antagonist that, that uh, also works at a spinal cord level to, to block uh, nociceptive um, stimuli. And then dexmedetomidine has this alpha-2 mechanism, which also uh, has an anti-nociceptive anti effect. So he's kind of blocking pain in three different ways. And then what he figured out is that, um, uh, well, he could actually run the propofol at half to a third of the dose that he normally would ha uh, have to run uh, to maintain unconsciousness. Um, uh, so, so okay, so uh, the vitals look good. I won't go through that. Um, receiving no in, uh, inhalational anesthesia and, and um, uh, respiration is fine, I guess. And then if you look at the EG... So you see this really nice alpha wave, and you can see like kind of a, a slow oscillation coming and going there. Uh, and if you believe the number, she's been just in this in this state, you know, really, really comfortably for for almost an hour, and, and probably before that. So with this combination of drugs, by by you know controlling the pain well, you can actually reduce the amount of um, of uh, um, uh, uh, anesthetic you need to maintain unconsciousness, propofol, uh, and 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 kind of balance out the anesthesia a lot better. Uh, and, and, and by reducing the amount of drugs you give, you can actually allow the patient to wake up uh, a lot faster at the end and more comfortably. So here's, here's one more. So, so it's, a, it's a question um, in the field right now as to whether um, uh, you can use these monitoring technologies in children and especially, you know, I, I, I think actually the, the consensus is that, you know, the monitoring doesn't apply to children. This is a slightly older child, but, but, I, but it, I think it illustrates the point. Um, so uh, this is a 19-year-old um, uh, male patient with severe autism. So he had a history of, of uh, aggression and behavioral issues. Um, he's large also, so he's a big boy. Um, he routinely takes um, uh, anti-epileptic uh, medications. So maybe the thought would be, you know, he's, he's able to uh, uh, clear the drugs uh, faster than, than uh, you know, a, a typical person. So he's in for a sigmoidoscopy for chronic constipation. So they actually have to just help clear his constipation. Um, uh, and he has to go under general anesthesia for this. So, um, so he has to be unconscious. And, and uh, he has to, you know, have his pain controlled. So uh, uh, before inducing um, uh, general anesthesia, they gave him uh, oral ketamine, uh, I actually don't know kind of if that's a higher low dose uh, because I don't have intuition for how the oral doses go. But he also received some um, uh, midazolam, uh, yeah, 0.2. So I think that's, that's, yeah, that's pretty typical, kind of on the high side maybe. Um, uh, and, uh, and then for uh, induction of uh, anesthesia, he received um, uh, one milligram per kilogram of, of propofol in a bolus. Um, and, then, uh, um, and then he had a, a propofol infusion of... Um, 350 uh, micrograms uh, per kilogram per minute. So this is actually really high. This is maybe you know more than um, uh, I would say double the typical dose for a, for an adult. Maybe for a young person it, it would be double the dose. I don't know. Um, so what ended up happening is that he had a delayed emergence for two hours. So in these clinical cases, you know, except for the ones where anesthesiologists on our team are, are manage them, we typically just record the case, especially in the pediatric cases, and we don't intervene because there's no, you know, kind of guideline for how you use the EEG. So we just record and we're using it as a way of studying. Uh, again, we can't influence the management in these recordings. But I kind of wish we could have because this is what we saw. So this is 
time in seconds here. So we're looking at, um, you know, maybe about half an hour of, of, of data here. So at the outset, after inducing, um, uh, so he's coming in here with this background of midazolam and ketamine. Right around here, the propofol bolus and infusion starts. The color is a little saturated here, but you can basically see a, a, a strong alpha, uh, sorry, alpha and slow. And there's a little bit of theta in there too. I think we we're just saturating the screen here. Um, and and um, uh, uh, so then, uh, the infusion, of course, is started right around here. And what you can see is is that the screen turns blue, okay? And then you zoom in, and so there's blue, you know, so silence, a burst of activity, blue, burst of activity, blue, burst of activity. And so this, and then blue there on out for about 20 minutes. So this patient's actually isoelectric, flat line on the EG, you know, totally, totally suppressed for about 20 minutes. So the clinicians didn't know this because they weren't looking at the monitor. But you know, when we went back and looked at it, you know, that's what we saw. And, and actually, um, uh, one of our med students was there. And so they actually, you know, uh, uh, usually she's just kind of a fly on the wall. But they're like, oh my god, you know, come back in and monitor this patient's brain because we don't know why he's not waking up. Well, he's not waking up because they gave way too much drug during the case. So it's just an example of how the simple introduction of this EEG monitor could make a lot of difference uh, for a lot of patients, we think. So, um, in summary, um, you know, uh, you know, we're, we really believe that the form of the EEG relates fundamentally to the mechanisms of the drugs and to the underlying brain states that comprise um, um, uh, general anesthesia and sedation. You know, uh, these uh, oscillations aren't subtle; they're really huge, quite easy to see. Um, uh, the spectrogram lets you easily visualize the EEG, but also lets you analyze it uh, as well uh, um, uh, for the neuroscientists here. Uh, what we found is that the, the different drugs have different signatures that relate back to the uh, underlying drug classes and mechanisms. Um, uh, with aging uh, and with development, the signal changes in size, but the uh, underlying structure remains. So that we think that you can use this across a, a broad range from you know, quite young children, say about one year of age or, or older, all the way up through, of course, elderly adults, if you just look at the signal. And then finally, the EEG provides a real-time readout of the individual patient's uh, drug response. Um, you can titrate it for every individual subject. You don't have patient. You don't have to uh, rely on a pharmacologic model. Uh, and um, you know this allows us to give personalized anesthesia care uh, to patients. Um, so I want to thank my um, uh, collaborators. Uh, you know I've worked with Emery Brown uh, for a long, long time uh, on these studies. I've also worked with uh, Shayun uh, uh to characterize the EEG in these different brain states. Um, um, and uh, I want to thank uh, all of you and, and the organizers, uh, Francisco, Pepe, uh, Carolina, for for putting this all together and for inviting me. Um, uh, um, you know, especially there were, there were uh, uh, some travel delays we had to contend with. So I really appreciate you know making adjustments and and thank you all again for for coming. At this time, we uh, have time for questions. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Most of the people here are not anesthesiologists. They, they may not know that anesthesia is basically a combination of a, of a lot of drugs. Or not a lot, but usually more than one. You have shown that you can monitor combination, but do you have a, have you ever tried to figure out there's a, a explicit pattern of certain combinations? Because, okay, propofol has a clear pattern, ketamine also, but in the war, there are combination of those drugs that all affects the brain in some way. So I don't know if you're trying to deal with that in or in your studies. Yeah. So uh, so and actually um, in part in in part of this online program and the there are two modules right now that are online. The second module there are lots of examples of that, but I'll just tell you verbally that yeah, in most cases actually the combinations sort of make sense. So if if ketamine you know has this you know, 30-ish hertz component and SIVO has slow and alpha, then when you put the two together, they actually kind of have almost a, some hybrid of the two. And then, uh, interestingly, um, with both SIVO and with propofol, there's, uh, when you combine it with ketamine, there's this interesting effect where, you know, the, 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 the propofol, you know, GABA um, induced of, uh, alpha oscillation, you know, requires GABA to actually make that oscillation, right? Um, uh, so uh, when you block the inputs of the GABA interneurons with the ketamine, you'd expect that that would go away. And it does, actually. At a high enough dose, you can actually see um, 
uh, the alpha oscillations go away and get replaced by the by, by gamma um, when you're combining propofol and and, and ketamine, uh, and the slow oscillation remains underneath. Um, a, a similar thing seems to happen with uh, ketamine in combination with dex, uh, and then uh, for the for the the drugs that tend to produce like a slow oscillation, whether that's you know the opioids, um, propofol, dex. So when they're combined, they seem to all just add up and make more and more slow oscillations. And then what happens at the higher frequencies is, you know, either not visible or a little unclear. So in most cases, it, it, it actually kind of makes sense as a hybrid. And um, and there are examples of that on the website. And we're, we're, we're going on to characterize that in a little more detail in the future. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. Thank you. Um, I have two questions related to your work with Propofol. Um, the first one is you've, you've mentioned at the beginning that there is a high variability between subjects with, that relates those and, and the state of consciousness, the unconsciousness state that the individual is. Yeah. So my first question is, um, what about the EEG, the relation, the individual? Because you've shown group data. Yeah. So I was wondering how is it if you also have a high degree of variability, individual variability, that relates the EEG signal and the state of unconsciousness that that individual is in? Uh, and the second question is, you've been in interpreting your data um, uh, saying that you have a, a, an increase of a frontal alpha. But alpha is not a rhythm that we do see in the awake state in frontal electrodes. So um, can we interpret that as an increased alpha that, I mean, we don't detect frontal alpha, or can uh, we just look at this data and, 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 and think that it might be just a, um, a decrease in the frequency of beta oscillations, of frontal beta oscillations. So it's the same mechanism, but it's just uh, reducing the frequency of the beta oscillations instead of, of, of having an alpha, a frontal alpha yeah, okay, appearing yeah, yeah. after. I, I, I um, hear what you're saying, yeah. Okay. So, so just to answer the first part, um, it, you know, although the um, uh, dose-response relationship for individual subjects is different, the nice thing is that the EEG patterns are are so stereotyped. They're so stereotyped. We we have like you know thousands of cases now of of EEG. You can you know we could go to an OR now, put on the electrodes, we'll see it. I mean it's it's very 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 stereotyped. Um, the the individual frequency like like and and these are these are things we're teasing out. Like the, like exactly where that you know what I'm calling frontal alpha sits. You know may vary from patient to patient. Um, the exact size of the signals you saw w will vary uh, according to age and, and, and development, but, but the form uh, for propofol, it's so stereotyped. It's really, really... Oh, no, and, and it, it relates to the state of consciousness. No, it's, 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 it's tightly locked to the state of consciousness, yeah. Uh, and then to answer your other question, no, that, that's totally a, a, a valid perspective completely, and I, I think that it's really just a, a matter of nomenclature. We, were, you know, we had chose the, the term you know, frontal alpha because you know, alpha usually re refers to the, the frequency band, right? We were thinking of the frequency band, you know, 8 to 12 hertz, uh, and it's frontal, but clearly it's a different, in a way, uh, um, uh, uh, physiologic mechanism than, say, the, the posterior alpha. So, so that, that's totally clear. And I guess Francisco is going to talk about this a lot more in his talk, which later today, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, um, so actually, I won't ruin that, but, but, but essentially, uh, you're, you're partly right, and then, and then he's going he's gonna to show you the details of that, yeah. Thank you, Patrick. That was really brilliant. Um, I have a question. So the patterns that you're showing us are pretty distinct, right? And this oh, is so a, the, the, distinct, the patterns yeah. that you're showing us are pretty distinct for the spectrogram, right? So this is a wonderful case where you can use a classifier to give you one number to tell you where the patient's, in which drug that patient is, and probably which doses that patient is having, right? And that would be fairly good for the doctors because it's just one number, right? So why? Uh, you see, for us, it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly easy to look at those patterns, right? But doctors, you know, may not have time to do that. So why not try classifiers and just give one number? Yeah, I, I think the reason is, um, you know, ultimately, there, there, I think there could be a, a, a classifier that you could use to kind of do, do the job properly. So first of all, at present, the job is not being done properly. So, you know, I think the... Uh, um, uh, when they started off trying to build these devices in the 90s, they didn't have this insight that, you know, age, 
uh, drug were the key covariates uh, that, that governed uh, the EG. And so as, as such, they didn't know how to structure and build the, if you will, algorithms to, uh, to account for those variables. And now certainly having presented it, it's clear, and one could construct an algorithm. But, but I actually think the, you know, um, the primary reason uh, uh, for, for not doing that is that it's too anti-intellectual. I mean, really, like, like the doctors, they, they, they're experts in physiology. Like my, they can look at, at the uh, uh, EKG, you know, see, you know, small, subtle things, interpret that. They can look at your respiratory waveforms, interpret that. They can have, you know, uh, um, uh, pulmonary catheters, and at every point, they could just look at the waveform, oh, yeah, I'm at this part of the, you know, uh, uh, pulmonary circulation. I mean, they have this exquisite knowledge, and it comes into play. It, it, it ends up being, you know, clinically useful. So I think for, um, uh, for, uh, for the profession of, of the, the specialty of anesthesiology, it's really important just to have that kind of installed as part of the, the knowledge base. I think it, it gives, for, for that field, it gives rise to, to many things that you can do to improve the anesthetic down, down the road. Insights that you wouldn't have if you didn't think about the mechanisms and, and the dynamics. And then the other, you know, super practical thing, thing is, hey, you know, machines, they're, they're prone to error. You know, they, they sometimes... Um, they sometimes uh, uh, fail, and and when they give something that that's odd or or not quite right, you need to go back to the fundamentals. So, if the the autopilot in the aircraft isn't working, you know the pilot's got to be able to take over. If the you know instrument guided landing system isn't working, the pilot's got to take over. So they they still have to be able to have that facility with the signal. I agree with you. What I was trying to think of is you know like imagine that you have a case that you don't know before, right? You can take a, an EEG and try to predict what kind of you know drug you should give you should give to that person so now you actually get into the the, the realm of prognosis yeah so you can actually do things that otherwise you can't because you know like now you, you once the subject is under propofol you can tell okay he's under this amount of propofol but what you would really want to achieve is i don't know who you're going to be but you know based on your e background eeg i think that this is who you want to be yeah and right. we're we're definitely working on that. I, I I didn't have time to show data on that, but that's um, especially with regard to aging and development. We definitely believe that. So there there should be it, it needs to be personalized on on that level. And there's you know essentially f fundamental you know brain physiology pathophysiology that should be able to tell us that. We're working on that. I'll try to work that in tomorrow because I think you guys will find that interesting. Um, and, and I think you're also pointing to the notion that that. Um, uh, um, you know, you could really personalize care for an individual patient if, if in, in some sense, this uh, uh, dose response information were part of their medical record. Um, that's a whole other <laughs> can of worms to deal with. But yeah, these are great thoughts and, and, and clearly, yeah, really important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the thing about uh, post op delirium, uh, you know, we, we know it's bad and we're all, we're all talking about that a lot lately. So, but is it that? Patients with post-op delirium will have more complications. Is it the egg or the, or the chicken? Uh, the patient was in a poor state, and he, he did bad. He had delirium because he, was, he had complications. He was in a bad shape. Or do you believe that because he had delirium, he will have these complications? Oh, so right. Is I it see. the egg or the chicken? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I think... Uh, Right, right. So essentially, I think both cases are probably, you know, possible. So, so in one instance, it's possible that um, no matter what you did, the patient was going to do bad because they had a pre-existing, you know, sort of, um, uh, uh, if you will, you know, brain problem. So, so no amount of like just the the the, the surgical inflammation would have been enough to cause further compromise and then result in their in their delirium. So, so I guess. There are definitely uh, categories of patients who are, are so fragile that that would, would I believe, would be true. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if, if um, you know, it's also possible that that things that happen during surgery, including the anesthesia and, and the amount of anesthesia, um, uh, could contribute to that uh, to the to the de delirium. So, so I guess the idea is that in the in the beginning you have this brain that has you know a degree of frailty and you don't know you know, what it is, and then the combination of, of factors that are, are happening, you know, the surgical inflammation, the anesthetic, the, the uh, ongoing, you know, kind of deep level sedation in the ICU, all those things can kind of chip away at the uh, brain reserve, I think, and then uh, at some point um, uh, result in, in, in delirium. I'll, I'll point to you also in the, in the Fritz paper um, uh, that, that they, they do show this kind of relationship between increasing uh, uh, time and birth suppression, and then the 
the uh, um, uh, delirium postoperatively. So suggesting that you could turn down the dose and at least reduce that that uh, influence. So in, in, in a sense, both the chicken and egg are, are, are true, I think. Okay, thank you. And also, uh, do you have any, um, do, do you know, uh, have you heard about the um, the use of general anesthesia in children and under two and problem with development. And that's been a huge topic uh, in the US. They had a warning installed in general anesthesia. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, no, I you know do. that. So can you tell us something about it? Oh, yeah. I, I definitely know that because on Sunday I was at the IRS, uh, International Anesthesia Research Society, and, and um, they uh, uh, picked us to give a panel in the morning. The FDA guys were there, and, and, and so, yeah, I definitely know this. So. Um, and we've been thinking about it. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm going to try to work this into tomorrow's uh, thing too. But I wonder if um, I don't know if I should. I don't know who's going to be there tomorrow. So let me just. I'll just give you the punchline now. So check this out. So so the the existing framework for that field is that okay, it's neurotoxicity, right? And that works with the FDA's approach, right? So okay, we're going to, you know, in an animal model. You know, if you give a certain amount of uh, a, a drug, it, it, it you know, uh, uh, kills neurons, you know, uh, in, uh, produces apoptosis, and then that is associated with, you know, cognitive performance issues and that would later affect the child. That's kind of the hypothesis, and at least in the animal models, there's lots of evidence for that. In the clinical studies, there's mixed evidence, and the way I break it down is to say that in... Um, in the clinical studies, where they're looking at specific, if you will, neurophysiologically principled measures of brain function, you know, something specific like recognition memory or, or, um, or, or maybe even learning disabilities on specific modalities, you see an effect. If you get a little higher, like more amorphous with, say, like Bailey scales or, or standardized test scores, the effect doesn't really show up. And interestingly, w one positive news is that, that children who receive anesthesia for uh, less than an hour at less than one year of age don't seem to have an effect when they measure, say, Bailey scales at, at, at two years of age. So that's good news. But, but um, what, what I think is happening is that a lot of the clinical studies that show no effect are looking at measures that are, are too coarse to pick up true develop developmental effects um, that can be sort of masked by the coarseness of the measurement or other factors of plasticity that that can you know make up for whatever deficits are introduced early on. And here's the key thing. This is the bombshell. This is the bomb we, 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 I'm going to drop. So um, um, these um, you know fundamental uh, I guess mechanism of of brain development in children are these critical periods of plasticity. So you may remember like. Um, um, say in the 30s, there was that experiment where like a, a goose hatches from an egg and then within 24 hours, uh, if they see a human, they will imprint on that human and just follow the human around as if the, it were its mother. That's the first example of a, of a critical period, a, a window of plasticity that opens transiently and then closes. Other examples would be in the first year of life, you know, you can uh, acquire like um, uh, language phonemes, right? Uh, and then at about nine, ten months of age, you lose that. So, so for instance, in uh, in in Chinese, you know, Cantonese, they're they're like nine tones, right? Uh, so, if you grew up listening to Cantonese, you could hear those tones. Uh, and then, uh, but if you didn't, you would have a hard time in adulthood, or even after ten months, picking them up. In Spanish, I think V and B have a very similar sound. So, you you know, in that first. 10 months, if you don't hear V and B, you'll have a harder time later on hearing it, right? And in, in Japanese, like um, uh, L and R, you don't hear L and R in the first 10 months of life, you can't distinguish it later on, right? So that's in that first 10 months. So that critical period, those critical periods, all of them, guess what they're opened by? GABA signaling. So I'll just stop right there. So that's our hypothesis. So we're, we're trying to chase that. It's been hard getting funding for it, but we're, all, we're trying to get after it. Hi, thank you for the talk, very nice. I wonder uh, which is the comparative importance of the reduction in the, um, uh, high, the high oscillation, the high frequency oscillations, in comparison, in comparison to the slow oscillation. And I wonder why I'm asking this. Because in our experiments in animals, actually in cats, uh, under a uh, cholinergic muscarinic antagonist, like sc scopolamine, you have an, an a slow wave uh, oscillation, very similar to non-REM sleep, slow way sleep, and the animal is fully awake. But the animal maintains, in any way, the, the, the high-frequency oscillations. 
And I wonder which is the importance, comparative, of the reduction of high frequency in comparison to the increase in the slow waves for the unconscious uh, process. Yeah, I think the increase in the slow oscillation is way more important. I mean, uh, um, and I, I haven't studied, you know, I hope you can tell me like uh, uh, the details of it for the uh, uh, scopolamine case, but, but I think the slow oscillation is way more important because essentially with increasing doses of, of, of a drug, you know, you can make that slow oscillation larger and larger and essentially make the, the down states more and more prolonged. And I think when, when those down states are, are really uh, um, uh, prolonged, you know, the cortex just can't be active and that's, you know, uh, a more powerful mechanism than say the the alpha one which seems to only you know um, uh, involve like the uh, um, uh, medial dorsal thalamus and, and frontal um, uh, medial prefrontal cortex yeah but the slow oscillation seems at least with propofol seems to be everywhere and so you have a, a much broader you know kind of cortical disruption yeah so I think slow oscillation is more important thank you thank you very much Patrick I I, I am also an anesthesiologist, and, and, I am, and now I am recording EEG also in, during the surgery. And for me, it's very when I have a patient with birth suppression, I, al I always think that, oh, what happened with the brain with the patient? So it has a negative consequence uh, immediately in the, during the birth suppression or not. And, and also I know that after that, the patient has more probability to to have delirium, also operative delirium. But between delirium and and birth suppression, they are I don't know. There are many changes that can occur in the brain. Uh, for me, it's, I, I really I don't know what happened with the brain during birth suppression and after. What happened to recover again the the normal rhythms? I don't know, what do you think about this period when the patient has a birth suppression and the consequence with the neural function and, and connection, currents, and I don't know. Right, yeah, what, what's the mechanism? How do you get from there to delirium, right? Yeah, yeah I don't know. I mean, I guess one, you know, um, um, one thought could be that, uh, um, I guess there's a lot of evidence that the that the anesthetics themselves are are just inherently neurotoxic. So it could be, be that we're just crossing over some threshold, or, or, or you know, that with the increasing dose, you, we start to see more of the neurotoxicity, which, which then you know manifests itself uh, uh, down the road as as brain function, aka delirium. So that's one uh, uh, possibility. Uh, so another possibility, though, is that you know you do see um, um, uh, um, you do see uh, uh, birth suppression uh, in stroke as well. So if you, you know, in animal models, if you, you know, provoke ischemia, you actually see birth suppression as a result of that. So it's possible that, that um, you know, we, we may be unmasking actually underlying, you know, neurovascular problems and that, that we, what we may be seeing is sort of, uh, you know, some uh, deficit in uh, either local or kind of diffuse brain perfusion, which then has consequences um, uh, uh, down the road as well. So, yeah, it's not really clear. We're trying to study it. We just got a grant that will allow us to do some neuroimaging so we can kind of uh, uh, correlate, you know, neurodegeneration, neurodegeneration or maybe uh, neurovascular problems with, you know, what we see with birth suppression in OR. So hopefully we can get uh, into that a little bit more. But it's, it's a great question and, you know, uh, I think a big question for the field. Uh, I, I forgot to thank you, Patrick. Very nice presentation. But you have described the transition from consciousness to loss of consciousness, and at least in Propofol, very clearly, uh, it, it it happens very fast. That something, uh, even as an anesthesiologist, uh, we didn't know. Basically, because most of the time we use a huge bolus, and the patients go down very quickly. But if you even if you do it slowly, like you did. In, in a very short time, you get from conscious to unconscious. But in and adding with Antonel, what Antonello asked, asking, have you ever, have you have an idea or an, an electro, electrophysiological pattern of the transition from, I would say, good anesthesia or good uh, deep good level of unconsciousness to to bare suppression? Is fast? Is slow? Or does best suppression appears 
in in a transition way or or in a fa in a quick way like c loss of consciousness in in idea to to predict that in during the the anesthesia we're going too much deep and we may be able to to uh, i don't know put less drug or something yeah sure okay so so um i think in general it, 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 it the transition is is is, prob is probably gradual because it, in, it, certainly in the 2013 study, we had a few patients that actually did go into, or subjects that did go into birth suppression. And, and what we saw is before they went into birth suppression, they had this um, particular uh, phase amplitude modulation pattern, which was different from what we were seeing during induction. So we saw this essentially, um, uh, if you will, uh, almost like a, an upstate uh, uh, a pattern where, where the alpha oscillations were, were highest at the peaks of the slow oscillation. And it was, you can actually see it by eye. You have to kind of get the montage right, but you can see it by eye in the waveforms. And, and you can certainly see it, you know, with some analysis. So, so that, that seems to come before birth suppression. Now the question is, you know, does that happen for all patients? I think it's probably pretty consistent for, for younger, healthier patients. But the impression I get from, you know, looking at data and from talking to Emery from his cases is that for the elderly patients, it's it's not so uh, so gradual. They seem to kind of just like dip into birth suppression, you know, really easily. So uh, and again, I think that may relate to some underlying kind of frailty uh, that they have. So so I think for them it could be could be more difficult. But but I think in general, yeah, it'll be possible to, to identify a pre birth suppression state. Uh, and and yeah, so so I think it, it it could be done, and it would help, you know, again guide um, titration. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Do everything. Um, all right, great. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank